All right, uh, hi guys. Hope you guys can all hear me and see me clearly. Um, so we've got 51 viewers, so welcome. I hope you guys are uh, coping well in this quarantine. Um, at MIMSA, we wanted to try and deliver uh, the lectures that we usually do um, every week or every two weeks. Um, but obviously we can't do that because everything is closed, so we've decided to try out this, this new online system. Um, so hopefully it works. Uh, send me a, just, just type up a comment if you can't hear me clearly or you can't see me. If there's any problems, and I'll try and fix it. Um, okay, so this is our first lecture on the cardiovascular system. Um, next week is going to be jumping into the neuro, uh, neuroanatomy uh, with the spinal cord and brainstem. So... Um, I've, we've made this uh, we've made this series uh, to to supplement your revision uh, in the same way that our usual lectures do. Um, so I'll just run through um, the the format of the lecture for you guys. So you can see um, I'm going to go through just very briefly because I know most of you already know this, um, but I'm going to go through um, the. Uh, the, the 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 main the main ways I would recommend you studying and not just this topic but just everything in general um, and then we're going to jump straight into the cardiovascular system so the majority of the time will be spent on the heart um, and you can see how I'm, I'm I, how I'll be explaining it uh, it's the same way that the white book explains it um, and then uh, jumping into the arteries focusing on the main arteries uh, I haven't included any of the arteries or veins which uh, were covered last semester in the dissection, the first dissection. Um, um, so that, that, that's going to be your, your revision uh, to do. Um, and I haven't included uh, thoracic segments either, so the thoracic aorta and also the, uh, the, the veins in the thorax. Um, in terms of uh, the veins, I'm going to uh, just talk about the uh, anastomosis that we find, the venous anastomosis. So... Um, um, so yeah, the porto uh, cable and the cable cable anastomosis, um, and yeah, and then hopefully some feedback uh, on the lecture, but also this this way of delivering lectures. Um, we 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 think it's quite useful. We think it actually can replace the lectures that we usually give. Uh, there seems to be a quite a nice turnout today. So um, yeah, let's carry on. I don't think the lecture will take three hours. It's listed on the on on the Facebook event as three hours, but probably will take two hours if that. So, so uh, I'm going to be going through anatomy as a whole. You already have your exam dates booked. Um, given the circumstances, they may change uh, the they may shift all the dates by two weeks. Um, but for now, just stick to your exam date near the time. Uh, our recommendation, which is the same for all exams, is to just to stick to the exam date you have, um, and and make a make a nice timetable or weekly timetable, um, which which encompasses all the revision and um, and allows you time for recapping as well. So the way I would recommend this is, uh, let's say uh, if you're studying the cardiovascular system uh, in let's say like from tomorrow, so this next week coming, you do the cardiovascular system, you do the heart, arteries, veins. Uh, and the following week, for example, let's say you did the um, urinary system, male genital system, and the female genital system. Uh, week number three, you want to, whatever you're doing, you want to be revising the cardiovascular system again, because it's very easy to forget these things, especially with anatomy, especially with the cardiovascular system, the arteries and the veins, there's, there's, there's just so many uh, branches and tributaries you need to remember. So you need to be constantly recapping, constantly uh, recalling, your, uh, recalling these, these facts from your memory. Um, so that you can, um, you know, remember them long term because it's very easy to forget. Uh, in terms of the materials um, I've used, um, I'm a strong advocate of, of just using the white faculty book and uh, a good atlas. So um, I've got here the 2014 edition, 2014 edition of the Splank Knowledge book, um, which I've quoted. And I've, I'm using uh, the images I've used are from the sixth edition uh, Netter's Atlas. So... Um, I don't really deviate from these materials, even when I teach. Um, I don't think there's any need to, to overwhelm you with, with other sources. I think just stick to the white book uh, and you've got everything in there. Um, and yeah, discipline, I guess discipline just because um, 
you need to you need to keep consistent. You need to stay consistent with everything else you're studying. Um, I would say probably 70, 80 percent of your time should be learning anatomy. Um, so you can be you can be ready for that date in summer. Um, so in terms of a uh, general scheme of how to explain the how to basically outline the question. Um, you know that there are two parts to the exam, the robot, and I have put some robot or rather mock robot questions in this PowerPoint, which we'll go through. Uh, but in terms of the oral exam, what you want to be doing is you want to be, uh, first of all, outlining the question. So start with the first part. The questions are quite detailed, so they give you quite a nice insight on everything that the examiner wants to hear. So you just explain the question. For example, blood supply of the stomach. You explain very, very ba like the basics of, uh, in terms of the names of the arteries which supply the stomach. Um, you draw out the celiac trunk, and then you go into the detail for each of the branches, each of the uh, so where are the branches located, um, which other structures are they located next to, um, and just this general position syntope. Um, and num point number three, I guess, is the most important one. Um, so follow the same layout in the book. So the layout in the book for this whole Spangology book is. Um, general overview and description first, then you move on to the position and syntope, then the anatomical parts, and then the blood supply and innovation. I would just follow this um, this this uh, layout. Um, yeah, they, they'll, they'll uh, whoever your examiner is, they'll understand. Uh, they'll, they'll know from, from, from how you explain the question that you have an understanding um, of the of the chosen topic. So I've put their page numbers. Um, again, 2014 edition, it might be slightly different in your book. Um, so, this is basically just summarized everything I've just said, I've kind of jumped ahead, um, but I would integrate YouTube videos, especially with arteries and veins, I would integrate YouTube videos with neuroanatomy as well. Um, there aren't a whole lot of sources out there, good sources for neuroanatomy, and the white book can be quite difficult, so, you know, you have to play around and see which, which YouTube channels you prefer. Um, if you can just study from the white book, then I th I'd say that's probably the best thing. But um, uh, yeah, YouTube YouTube videos will definitely try will definitely help you try and understand the basics basic concepts. Um, I'll link the uh, useful uh, anatomy video channels on YouTube um, on the description after we upload this this video. Uh, but off the top of my head, I think obviously D Dr. Najib lectures for neuroanatomy, I think, are very good, especially if you have time. And at the moment, everything uh, at the moment, every one of us has time. So uh, I think definitely give those give those a go for neuroanatomy, um, anatomy zone, uh, osmosis, Ken Hub. Th you know, these are all other useful tools as well to just outline the, the basics. Um, after you've recapped, after you've spent time studying the content yourself, uh, the most important thing you can do to, to, to assure yourself that you you understand the topic is to say it out loud. So exactly like how I'm doing, for example, now uh, is how I uh, how I studied myself for the anatomy exam. I practice speaking out aloud, and I think if you can either speak out to yourself or to you know speak to a friend or a group of friends, uh, if you can try and explain the concepts to them, then you can be sure that you know the concepts yourself quite well. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm a really strong advocate of, of speaking out loud rather than very, you know, a lot of people use passive learning, highlighting and, and reading. Um, it may work for some people, but for, I think for the majority of people, uh, you can really cement the, the information if you, uh, if you actually say it out loud. Um, yeah, so I think you guys already know this. So let's just jump into the actual uh, lecture. So, um, so first of all, uh, general overview, description of the heart. This is all information which has been lifted, literally lift, lift, lifted from the white book. Um, in terms of the sizes and everything uh, of these organs, I'm talking in general. Uh, it's not the end of the world if you don't know them, if you don't know the dimensions, if you can't recall the weights, for example. Um, but this is just an approximation. Um, what they uh, what they will uh, pick up on is in the robot, if, as you can see here, um, uh, approximately 300 grams in adults. So that fact there, they might throw into the robot into one of the questions. They might say something like, "Pick, choose the incorrect statement," um, and they'll, it'll say something like, "Approximate weight of the heart is uh, adult heart is around 600 grams." So 
you know you can you can see how they they might try and throw you out um, by not knowing these numbers. But I think it's quite common sense uh, if, if everyone has an understanding of, of what 300 grams is and the size, approximately the size of your clenched fist um, in terms of dimensions. So you already know you should already know that uh, from biology that is composed of four chambers. So we have two atria and two ventricles. Um, the great vessels, uh, so the ones originating at the base of the heart, are the aorta, pulmonary trunk, and the pulmonary veins. Um, the heart itself has a dual circulation, so it can obviously be divided up into the atria and the ventricles, but it can also be divided up into a left and a right heart. So the left heart is receiving blood, uh, oxygen-rich blood, from the lungs and delivering it to the body via the aorta, and the right heart is doing the opposite. So it's receiving the blood from the body, this is uh, deoxygenated blood, and it's pumping it to the lungs to be reoxygenated. Um, okay. So in terms of the position and syntope, um, and again, this relates to top, uh, topography question, um, I've used a, a scheme here, a really nice scheme I've uh, got lifted from Memorix, um, which uh, is in the, uh, yeah, it's in the uh, chapter for the, um, uh, cardiovascular system um, just shows you the different parts of the mediastinum. So if you mention the heart is located in the middle inferior uh, mediastinum, so you can see this grey area here. Um, if you mention this in the exam, you know you can you might be asked to just explain different parts of the mediastinum. It's not very common, but they can often ask um, this question. Sorry, the image is cut here, but it should say the word left. Um, so the, the heart itself is deviated to the left side. I'll explain in a second what that means. Um, and the longitudinal axis, again, is caudally eventually into the left. So what that means is that we have uh, two poles, essentially, of the heart. Uh, we have the base and we have the apex. So when we talk about the longitudinal axis of the heart, if you draw, draw sort of like an imaginary line from the base of the heart, so the base of the heart being this, uh, this area here, this is the base, and the apex is obviously down here. So if you were to draw an imaginary line, uh, it's a vector. So in 3D space, it's oriented. Um, it's oriented caudally, ventrally, and to the left. So please remember that. It makes sense. And uh, they throw that into the robots a lot as well. Also, the opposite can be said. So that's the direction of the apex of the heart. But the direction of the base of the heart is the opposite. So it's cranially, dorsally, and to the right. Um, so I mentioned the base, which is where we find the great vessels, the large vessels of the heart, and the apex is tapered, uh, tapered end of the heart. Um, we have two surfaces and we have two borders. So the anterior surface is also known as the sternocostal surface um, because it's in contact with the sternum and the ribs, quite logically. Uh, it's on the other side of this image, we can't see it. Uh, what we can see here, though, is the other surface, the inferior surface, also known as the diaphragmatic surface. Logically, because it's in contact with the diaphragm. Um, borders are quite interesting. On the left side of the heart, this is the left side, we have a, uh, a surface. So it's a, it's a smooth, rounded surface. Whereas on the right side of the heart, it's a sharper, uh, more angular border. So it's just called the right border, not the right surface. Um, in terms of other structures we find uh, on the heart, there are a few grooves which we need to talk about. So... Um, uh, I haven't included them on this slide, they're on another slide, but on the anterior side of the heart, between the ventricles, we have the anterior interventricular um, sulcus, so a groove for um, uh, in which we find vessels, an artery and a vein, and the same thing on the posterior side, so these obviously are vessels I'm pointing to, but they lie inside the groove, and this is the posterior interventricular sulcus, and the third sulcus, the third groove, is a... Um, uh, it runs the circumference of the heart, and it's located between where you find the atria and the ventricles. So this is called the coronary sulcus. Um, and the coronary sulcus, like I said, runs the entire circumference of the heart, with the exception of the uh, aorta and the root of the pulmonary trunk. So there's around two inches uh, on the anterior or the ventral side where the coronary sulcus, uh, well, doesn't exist, basically. I've underlined it because students often confuse the coronary sulcus with the coronary sinus. Two different things. We'll come to that in a bit. Um, other structures, other, other, other points I wanted to mention, cardiac septum. The cardiac septum is inside the heart, so it can't be... I'll show you, I'll show you where the cardiac septum is 
uh, in a later slide. But uh, the septum itself is divided up into uh, the septum between the atria. So this is logically the interatrial inter septum and between the ventricles, interventricular septum, just dividing up the left and the right heart. And the crux, um, this is a word which is mentioned once. There's one mention of this in the book. Uh, if we look on the posterior side of the heart, there is a there's an area over here. This is all the crux. So how do you describe this? It's the um, position where the coronary uh, sulcus intersects the posterior interventricular sulcus. Okay, so this area here. So um, these are the uh, this is the surface anatomy of the heart, the gross anatomy of the heart. So we'll jump into the uh, the different. Uh, then, uh, the different um, chambers of the heart. So first of all, the right atrium. So right atrium is um, is a is a hot question. I think there's a, there's a few you know really um, uh, unique questions uh, in every in every in every chapter, which which you you just have to know. You have to know them perfectly. Um, it's difficult to say which questions are weighted or how they're weighted rather, um, but um, questions are definitely weighted somewhat. Um, so right atrium, like I said, you need to know the full detail which is found in the white book. So the way you start describing the right atrium is that it's modeled like a cube. Uh, so there are six sides to the right atrium, you can just imagine. So there's a medial surface, lateral surface, superior and inferior surfaces, and then a posterior and anterior surface. Um, or you can say ventral and dorsal, it doesn't really matter. Um, so this is the orientation of the heart. Uh, posterior surface. I'm going to show you a scheme in the next slide. Uh, posterior, and we're going to be looking at the posterior surface. So the posterior surface here is this area here, and it has been cut to reveal the medial surface here, the uh, anterior or ventral surface here. This would be the roof or the superior surface, and this entire area here is the inferior surface or the floor. Um, you can see how the, the 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 dissection has been made. It's been made along. Uh, this so-called sulcus terminalis on the outside. The sulcus terminalis is the is the groove uh, on the outside of the heart. It corresponds to a structure which is located on the inside of the heart, which is called the terminal crest or the crista terminalis, which we can see here. And the significance of this is uh, well, actually, I'll explain in the next slide. Uh, let's just jump into that. So. Um, Again, very, very simple scheme. Uh, I would recommend you guys just draw the scheme, draw one, draw one of these schemes. It's not in the book. I think it would be nice if they had included it, but it's not in the white book. Um, um, and you can see here, well, try and orientate yourself first of all. So you can see this is the medial, lateral, superior, inferior. We're looking at the posterior wall and you can see uh, in the background, this weird shape wall here, this is the, uh, the ventral surface. So medial surface, what are the main structures we can find here? Well, the first thing is the uh, fossa ovale, so the oval fossa. It's an embryological remnant of the um, oval window or the oval foramen, foramen ovale. Um, I've got a mixture, just a quick note, I've got a mixture of English and Latin in here. Um, where possible, I will try to give the Latin, um, but I gave my exam in, in kind of a mixture. But you can see everything on this slide is in Latin for you guys who learn Latin. Uh, bordering this uh, fossa of eye is uh, a thickening on the on the sort of the roof of the of the fossa, this pit, uh, which is the limbus fossa of eye. Uh, on the lateral surface, so this is going back to the previous slide where I mentioned we have the uh, terminal crest. The crista terminalis is located somewhere on the lateral side, and the significance is that the internal surface of the lateral wall, which is located in front of this crista terminalis contains the rough uh, muscular part, okay, so the, the pectinate muscles. I'm just going to switch back to the previous slide so we can just have a look at this, how this looks. So again, so crystal terminalis is over here, and you can see everything in front of it is rough, rough in surface, these are the pectinate muscles. So just pay attention to this word, uh, pectinate, uh, can be confused with a lot of other words for muscles in the heart. <clears throat> so everything ventral to this, rough pectinate muscles. Behind it is a smoothened surface, okay? We have a very smooth surface behind the, the uh, crystal terminalis. 
On the superior uh, surface, the roof, we can find the opening of the superior vena cava. This is called the ostium. Ostium just meaning opening or orifice. Um, and uh, also, I'll mention this bulging in a second uh, when I talk about the anterior um, surface. Uh, inferior surface uh, has two notable landmarks. Um, so first of all is the opening or the ostium for the uh, inferior vena cava uh, and the opening for the coronary sinus. So uh, you can see them listed here. Each one of these structures has a valve. The valve is there to prevent backflow because the blood uh, is uh, traveling against gravity. So the valve just assists in the, in the directioning of the blood into the right atrium. Um, post yeah, so posterior surface, anterior, anterior surface, um, the main thing here to say is the uh, opening or the orifice for the uh, atrioventricular, the right atrioventricular valve, also known uh, as this uh, tricuspid valve, um, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And the last thing to mention, it's I've mentioned, I've included it here as part of the anterior surface, but it's technically the roof as well. So this bulging here is just the right oracle or right atrial appendage. You might you might find it written like that. Um, and one other thing to mention is that the um, the right oracle, in addition to the left oracle, uh, contains the pectinate muscles um, as well. Okay. So right ventricle. Um, the way that we divide the right ventricle is into an inflow and an outflow uh, part. So if we imagine, uh, so we've left the right atrium, right atrium is over here. This structure here is what I was just mentioning, the atrial uh, appendage or oracle. Um, so now we're into the right ventricle uh, and this section here. So inflow is where the blood enters somewhere and it stops somewhere here and then the, everything after this part so this is the direction of the blood traveling towards um traveling towards the um the semilunar valve here the pulmonary valve is the outflow part so first of all inflow part you can see it's a very rough the wall of the uh, the right ventricle is 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 covered by these um trabeculae carnae so these structures here muscular structures these are just uh, uh these are just foldings of the myocardial wall um the tricuspid valve itself has three cusps, as the name suggests, a septal cusp, a posterior cusp, and an anterior cusp. Um, I think, yeah, um, each cusp is anchored, and this is a, actually a point which I forgot to, to, to oh, I did here actually, yeah. No, I didn't. Um, so the cusps are anchored to the, uh, the, the, the uh, myocardium by papillary muscles. So uh, we have an anterior, a posterior, and a septal papillary muscle. Please learn the connections. Um, and also, uh, just remember that the, there's a point which I forgot to include here. The cusps are anchored to the papillary muscles by these uh, cords. These are called the chordae tendine. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so if you look at the base of, I don't know how clear it is for you guys, if you've got the resolution up to max, but if you look and, at, at the base of the septal, uh, the septal papillary muscle, you find a structure, a free structure, muscular band, which extends from the interventricular septum to the base of the uh, papillary muscle itself. So uh, logically, this is called the septomarginal trabecular. Um, and the significance of the septum marginal trabecula is that it contains the right bundle branch of connecting of conducting fibers. Um, so we'll mention this again uh, and a bit later when we discuss the conductive system of the heart. But um, I've seen this uh, this structure thrown into the robot quite a few times because it's exclusive for the right ventricle. So you don't have this structure in the left ventricle. So please pay attention to that. Um, <clears throat> And to just finish off, to just close off the uh, inflow part, this section here is called the supraventricular uh, crest. Okay, now into the outflow part. So outflow part, you can see it's a very smooth. We don't have these trabeculae carnae. The first part is called the infundibulum. So this area here is the infundibulum, also known as the conus arteriosus. Um, I've written this in just because uh, when it comes to learning the coronary arteries, there is a branch, a conus branch, so now, uh, so if you just remember that the infundibulum is the conus arteriosus, uh, that'll make more sense later on. Um, so from the infundibulum, we have the orifice. The orifice, just remember, is the opening or where we find the uh, valve. So the orifice for the pulmonary valve, 
the pulmonary valve, um, as opposed to the tricuspid valve, is a semilunar valve. So there are no there are no um, cordae tendineae, there are no papillary muscles, um, and we'll discuss the mechanics of the valves uh, in a later slide. But um, I've included this scheme here. The scheme is a very simple scheme, simplistic scheme, scheme which you can you know understand very easily. Um, it's in the white book. Uh, and it just shows you the, the different parts of the semilunar valve, uh, the semilunar uh, cusps. So you can see uh, this scheme is just basically illustrating one of these three cusps. So we have the uh, number two I'll start with is the lunule. This is the free margin. The central thickening of the free margin is the nodule and uh, the, sp uh, the space or the, the volume which is uh, filled behind the cusp itself is uh, which you can see in this image. It's been filled with blood. Uh, that's called the sinus. So the pulmonary valve itself has a anterior left and a right cusp. Um, I'll repeat this later on, but please pay attention to this. Um, the aortic valve also has three cusps, also has a left and a right cusp, but it has a posterior cusp. If you just look at the words pulmonary anterior, and then remember aortic has a posterior cusp, uh, so A and P, if you switch those letter, letters around, you can kind of remember it like that. That's how I remembered it. So P uh, with A, and then A for aortic matches with P for posterior. But we'll revise this in a second. So left atrium, <clears throat> in comparison uh, to the right heart, I think the left heart is a, is a lot simpler. There are fewer structures to remember. So learn the uh, learn the right heart very well, like you know, really thoroughly. And the left heart is, is quite simple, it's quite straightforward. So left heart, the main difference is here. So again, you can model the um, the left atrium as a cube, um, medial surface. We're just going to recap uh, medial surface uh, or the septal surface has the fossa ovalis. We can see here um, anterior surface has the protuberance here, the left auricle, the left atrial appendage, uh, again with the pectinate muscles. Um, and you find the ostium or the orifice uh, for the uh, bicuspid valve, the left atrioventricular valve. We call it the mitral valve. Um, <clears throat> so what are the structures? The other significant structures are found on the posterior surface. So we find the openings for the pulmonary veins. So we have uh, two left and two right pulmonary veins. Um, and just for revision, these are delivering oxygen-rich blood from the lungs to the uh, left atrium to be uh, transported to the body via the aorta. Okay. Left ventricle. Um, so left ventricle, uh, something I just haven't mentioned here, which I think I should mention is uh, it's quite a logical statement, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, when you look at the heart specimens, you'll notice that the uh, the wall of the left atrium, uh, sorry, wall of the left ventricle is significantly thicker then the wall of the right ventricle, logically, uh, it has to be able to pump blood through the uh, high pressure system to the aorta to the entire body. Whereas the left, uh, uh, sorry, the left ventricle does that, whereas the right ventricle only needs to pump blood to the lungs. So if you think about distances, uh, it, they're quite proportional. Thickness of the wall to the distance that the blood needs to travel. So left ventricle can be modeled in the same way as the right ventricle in the sense that we have an inflow part and we have an outflow part. So Inflow part again, trabeculae carne. These are these uh, th these are the myocardial um, structures which we find on the wall, uh, which give us this um, this rough appearance. The mitral valve itself, it's a bicuspid valve, so the meaning two cusps. We just have an anterior and a posterior cusp. Uh, they are anchored uh, via their respective uh, papillary muscles, anterior and posterior. And then the outflow part, uh, which I think was easier to see on this, uh, yep, on the previous slide. So this is the outflow part here, um, and we can see again uh, an, uh, a vestibulum. So this area is called the uh, the aortic vestibulum, um, which we find the aortic uh, orifice and the aortic valve. Um, so here is the aortic orifice. This is the aortic valve, and remember I mentioned that we have a uh, left, a right, and a posterior um, cusp. The left and the right uh, aortic um, cusps are also called uh, left and right coronary cusps because the um, sinuses uh, of these cusps will fill with blood 
during diastole and blood will pass through into the left and right coronary arteries but I'll uh, show you a better scheme uh, when we cover the, the when we cover the arterial supply <clears throat> So uh, the book mentions this, uh, gives like a very brief overview um, of systole and diastole. Um, if you're studying uh, physiology at the moment, you'll have to know all this in a lot more detail. But just for now, uh, for you guys in first year, um, just try and remember the two, uh, the two main things, basically. So we have two phases uh, of the heart. So we have a relaxing phase and a contracting phase. So... Um, Systole is our uh, uh, is, is the period where we have the phase where we have uh, ventricular uh, contraction. Um, so you can see here the mechanics, the arrows pointing, which are contracting the, the ventricle, ventricles of the heart, which are squeezing blood out. The main thing is you need to just remember now uh, for systole, we have open semilunar valves. So aortic and pulmonary valves are open and we have closed tricuspid and mitral valves. OK, so. Contraction forces the blood into the vessels, whether it's through the aorta or through the pulmonary trunk. So this is the uh, aorta, this is the pulmonary trunk. This is what systole looks like. You can see here the semilunar valves are open and the um, atrioventricular valves are closed. And it's the exact opposite. So after contraction has taken place, the um, <clears throat> well, the uh, there are a couple of steps missing, but um, what will happen is the atria will fill with blood and the uh, tricuspid and mitral valves will open and uh, this is the phase which is called ventricular filling, so diastole, relaxation phase, ventricles fill. And the exact opposite occurs. So they're filling, therefore the atrioventricular valves, tricuspid and mitral valves are open, and the semilunar valves are closed, which we can see illustrated here. And that's all we need to know uh, for anatomy when it comes to mechanics. So in terms of the uh, structure of the heart wall, uh, we need to discuss three main uh, layers, okay? So the internal, innermost layer. Innermost layer is modeled similarly to the endothelium in the vessels. It's called the endocardium. It's a very thin, uh, very thin layer, um, which, which, which um, is found in the inner surface of the heart. The next layer is the thickest, the thickest layer, which is called the myocardium. It's divided up into, and you'll learn this in more in histology, but it's divided up into working and conducting myocardium. The working myocardium is what's where the contractile elements are. Uh, these are the cardiomyocytes stacked end to end, um, and uh, specialized sections of the myocardium have the ability to conduct the electrical uh, impulses. This is just called these these areas are called the conducting myocardium, and um, we'll review this in a in a later slide. So the outermost layers are a bit where it gets a little bit tricky, I think, for students. So uh, external to the uh, myocardium, we find a, uh, a uh, we find a dual or two layered um, I would say sheath, uh, which is called the pericardium. Between the two layers, we have the pericardial cavity, uh, which contains pericardial fluid. Um, the two layers, as you can see here, are parietal and visceral pericardium. Uh, another way of dividing up the pericardium, which is done in our white book, is by talking about fibrous and acerous pericardium. Uh, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, and also mention the fibrous skeleton of the heart, which is a very common question uh, in the robot as well. So, fibrous, first of all, I'll discuss the fibrous skeleton and the fibrous pericardium, and then we'll talk about the serous pericardium. So, um, to understand what the fibrous skeleton is, uh, because it's this uh, scheme which you'll have in your white book, very crucial scheme, and I've put this image from Netters in here because it's showing the exact same thing. Um, so, you know, a lot of these a lot of these schemes in the white book are quite abstract. It's quite difficult to understand them. I, I understand. Uh, I understand the struggle uh, from when I when I learned it all. But um, if you just try and relate them to to actual uh, atlas images, it does really help. Um, Rather than memorizing the scheme, you can understand it better if you have the image next to it. So the dense connective tissue structure, which is found uh, at sort of between the dividing up the atria to the ventricles, uh, the, what you have to be able to explain the basic function. So I've written here what the function is. It's dividing the atria ventricles to ensure independent contraction. So we're going to talk about the conductive system of the heart in a moment, and we're going to learn that there are very specific pathways 
which uh, allow the heart to contract. Um, any deviation from these pathways will result in, uh, in generally arrhythmias and um, there are several uh, pathological problems which can take place uh, if we have, uh, for example, ectopic uh, foci of where the uh, contraction can start. So to ensure we have correct normal physiological conduction uh, pathways, we have an insulatory barrier. So during, so basically in these areas we, we have no we have no conduction. Um, um, that's the essential function, I guess, uh, basic functions. So the components I've listed here, uh, the components are listed again uh, in the white book in the scheme. I think you just memorize them, just understand that we have rings and we have triangles or trigones. The rings are encircling the uh, valve orifices. So you can see there are four rings, a left and a right fibrous ring around. So left fibrous ring logically would be located around the uh, mitral orifice and the right fibrous ring is located around the tricuspid orifice. Um, and we can see here we have pulmonary valve and aortic valve. This is quite an important thing to mention as well, actually. The, uh, try and uh, understand this uh, scheme and image as well. You can see that the pulmonary uh, valve, or in, in actual fact, the pulmonary trunk uh, is located ventrally to the aorta. Um, if, you haven't already, if you haven't seen this uh, image, just try and understand the, the positioning of the, the structures. Uh, we have trigones, so these are just uh, one here. This is the left fibrous trigone and the right fibrous trigone. Uh, again, insulatory dense connective tissue. Um, and then we have uh, some other structures as well. But the main things here to understand are is really just the function of the, the, uh, the fibrous skeleton. <clears throat> um, before we go, yeah, because, because the previous scheme uh, had the valves drawn out quite nicely, I just wanted to do a quick s slide on the valves themselves um, before I talk about the serous pericardium. So just a quick interval, um, because it is mentioned in the book, actually, the valves are mentioned. Um, so when we listen to the heart, so when we auscultate the heart uh, or the, the chest, sorry, with, with the stethoscope, we're not listening to the, uh, the snapping closed, the snapping sound made by the closure of the or opening of the, um, the valves themselves. What we're listening to is we're listening to this, the, 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 the sound which is generated, but it's traveling. So basically, we find auscultatory points on the chest. And um, you can see here that blood actually carries the sound generated uh, from valve closure to points on the chest. So these points in the chest don't correspond directly to where we find the vessels themselves, but they correspond to where the blood is, is, is transporting this, this sound, conducting the sound. Um, so there are four uh, auscultatory points. Uh, this is kind of bread and butter for, uh, for clinical studies, so you need to know this stuff very well. Um, <clears throat> the aortic and the pulmonary auscultatory points are located uh, in the second intercostal spaces, uh, so one centimeter, one to two centimeters to either side of the sternum. So you can see aortic is located to the right side and the pulmonary is located to the left side. Um, the uh, tricuspid valve is, can be, can be uh, auscultated either side of the septum, but it's always at the level of the fifth intercostal space. Um, and uh, mitral valve is to the left, so eight centimeters approximately to the left of the sternum. Again, fifth or sixth intercostal space. Um, these positions can be quite kind of can be quite variable, but if you just remember two, two, and five and five, I think for anatomy that's that's all you need to know right now. Um, I've got this scheme here just to show you, just to illustrate the valves, because um, a very common question which is asked in the oral exam uh, is about the differences between the valves. So we have two different sets of valves, yeah, you know, which I mentioned before. Uh, we have these valves, which are the atrioventricular valves, anchored to the papillary muscles, and then we have semilunar valves. Pulmonary valve isn't shown here, but it's the same. It looks identical to this, um, with with a couple of things missing. Um, so I just wanted to show you here. This has been opened up, so we can see here. Um, I'm not quite sure which is okay. So this is the posterior. Yeah, this is the posterior cusp here. Um, this would be the left coronary artery uh, starting here, and the right coronary artery start, starting here. So blood will uh, be evacuated uh, through into the aorta, and then it will fill the sinuses. And as it fills the sinuses, the valve will close. So the, mecha the, the mechanics of valve closure and opening are unique. Yeah, so that's the, that's the, um, the key difference. You need to be able to explain how the valves are operated. 
the atrioventricular valves open and close depending on based on um, uh, impulse transduction and then contraction of the papillary muscles. Um, that's how they operate. The semilunar valves will open and close depending on uh, relative pressure gradients and volume. So when we have uh, volume, uh, you know, high volume in the aorta, it will back up, like I mentioned, into the um, and fill the sinuses, fill the aortic sinuses, and that will close the valves. Once it does so, blood will enter into the uh, coronary arteries. So we'll discuss this in a moment, but it's important to understand where the arteries actually start from. Um, and just remember, this is the aortic valve. This is not the pulmonary valve. Pulmonary valve looks identical to this without these openings. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, myocardium. So just a couple of things I want to mention here uh, before we talk about the uh, pericardium in a bit more detail. Um, we, we, touched, we touched on the fact that the, the myocardium is divided up into two parts, working and conducting. The book goes into some detail about the, each fascicle and each vortex that we find inside the working uh, myocardium in the atria and the ventricles. It's important to have a general understanding of the names, um, but it's not the end of the world. If you forget these things, it's just important to remember some key differences. The key differences, well, the key differences, well, First things first, the atria have two layers, so a superficial layer of the myocardium and a deep layer, whereas the ventricles have three layers, uh, a middle layer as well. Um, and uh, I think the reasons are quite logical just in terms of the thickness and the, the, the functions of the, the, the chambers themselves. Uh, in terms of the conducting myocardium, uh, this is a recap from biology again. Um, you should know that the um, sinus rhythm is generated from the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node is located, uh, if you can see this image very clearly, you can see where it's located. It's located in the right uh, atrium, located adjacent to the opening of the uh, coronary sinus, which is here. This is the opening of the inferior vena cava, opening of the coronary sinus. Uh, so here you can see the sinoatrial node. <clears throat> Sorry, my mistake. That is not the sinoatrial node. This is the sinoatrial node. This is the atrioventricular node, sorry. So the sinoatrial node is located adjacent to the um, superior vena cava in the right atrium. The AVN, atrioventricular node, also located in the right atrium. Um, and the continuation is through to the interventricular septum. So in the interventricular septum, we have the atrioventricular bundle, which divides up into two branches. So we touched on this earlier, but we have a left and a right bundle branch. It's the right bundle branch, which travels uh, in the uh, in the septum marginal trabecula, which we discussed, which is present only in the right ventricle, and after the bundle branches we have uh, the Purkinje fibers. So Purkinje fibers are the very small fibers, look, which which reach all the way to the apex and uh, which reach to the apex and turn back on themselves. Um, okay, in terms of the pericardium, pericardium. Uh, this is a nice scheme actually. Which we can so if you look at this scheme over here, this is a this is a um, uh, a cross section. Uh, so we can see lungs, we can see heart, we can see the pulmonary artery aorta. Uh, this is a this is this sort of uh, double layered sac, which is the pericardial cavity, is located um, most superficially, and it contains the um, serous fluid, um, the the serous pericardium. Um, in terms of the fibrous pericardium, the fibrous pericardium are just, you just need to remember the attachments, okay? So you need to remember that we have an attachment of this fibrous pericardium, this dense connective tissue at the base, uh, at the cupula, uh, the sternal wall, which is adjacent to obviously the sternum, the bone in front, the lateral walls either side, uh, and the posterior wall. So these are just attachments of, which, these are just attachments which anchor the uh, fibrous pericardium to the adjacent structures. Um, the serous pericardium gets a little more tricky, um, but there's no reason for it to be uh, difficult to understand. I think the difficulty arises from the fact that this scheme is a little abstract. But again, if you look at something like this, which is the exact same thing, you know, you start to understand a bit better. Um, so this scheme uh, in Netters, this diagram in Netters, has uh, removed the heart. So you can see the great vessels, so superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. Um, you can see the, oh, 
yeah, this is the lung, so just ignore that. But this is the um, pulmonary, uh, sorry, aorta. And pulmonary trunk bifurcation is there, yeah, okay. So they haven't divided up into left and right, but you can see pulmonary trunk here. Uh, and you can see the pulmonary veins. So <clears throat> the significance here is uh, if you look uh, around these uh, great vessels, you can see this, uh, this layer. This is the fibrous pericardium, which we discussed before. Um, and you can see how the pericardium uh, envelops the vessels. Uh, so you can see it quite clearly in this scheme. And uh, the arrangement or the way that these, these vessels are, are covered allows for the passage of the pericardial fluid um, through two spaces. So we have uh, what's called a transverse uh, sinus. So our transverse sinus is located uh, here. And we have our oblique sinus. Oblique sinus is located uh, here. This is just a passage for the fluid, uh, essentially. Um, and two other things to mention are that the uh, structure, the, the, the vessels are grouped into two clusters. So the, the cluster, which is the um, aorta here, and the pulmonary trunk uh, is called um, so-called uh, porta arteriorum, and we have the porta venarum, which is around the vena cava superior and inferior, and the pulmonary veins. So these are just sheaths around the, the structures. Um, <clears throat> so the book touches on a little bit of radiology as well. And I think it's important to mention this because uh, after you um, complete your oral exam, you'll be given um, a variable number, usually like two, maybe three um, uh, x-rays. And you need to just be able to explain what you see. So the way you describe this, and I'm sure you know we can do, we can prepare a PowerPoint on this or a lecture on this later on. But the way you do this is, you, you when you receive the X-ray, is just explain first of all what you're looking at. So rather than saying this is a X-ray of the heart because that's incorrect, you say this is a X-ray of the chest, uh, and then you talk about detail. So uh, some okay for the chest, it's not easy to see, but for others, it is easy to see if there is contrast. So you can actually explain the name of the x-ray you're looking at um whether you know whether it's uh, whether you're looking at urography cystography whatever but for the chest x-ray um it's usually they're usually always posterior anterior the ones they'll give you um the way you describe it is you need to talk about the because this is obviously heart we're talking about today um so i'm not going to talk about the entire chest but you need to talk about the heart shadow so start from the left side work all the way down and start from the right side work all the way down so you can see very clearly we have the aortic arch. The first thing we see, the first bulging is the aortic arch. Um, we can also, sometimes we can see another bulging, which is where we have the brachiocephalic, uh, brachiocephalic trunk, um, but it's not easy to see on this, this scheme. So we can see brachiocephalic trunk here. Um, then aortic arch, then we find the uh, pulmonary trunk and we find the left uh, atrium. Left atrium is located here. This entire structure is left ventricle. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we find the superior vena cava. Superior vena cava transitions into the uh, into the um, right uh, atrium. So once again, this is the superior vena cava somewhere here, right atrium, and then right ventricle. Um, if you have the chest X-ray, you would need to discuss the other structures as well in terms of the bronchi and the lungs, um, potentially even diaphragm. Um, and maybe even ribs and vertebrae, but the main things here are the heart we're looking at, so um, just focus on the heart shadow for now. Um, something else which is mentioned in the um, book, which I haven't talked about, which I'm not talking about today, but just going to give a few words, is uh, measurements. So these are measurements of the heart, so we can look at um, different diameters. So we can look at the heart shadow, we can measure the distance from the midline to the left-hand side, midline to the, uh, the right-hand side, Take a sum of that, we can look at the actual length of the heart, and we can look at the, ape, uh, the apex to the base, uh, and we can measure these various distances, and they can be used uh, to, to determine some diagnosis if there is any pathology. Um, okay, so in terms of vessels, um, we have uh, <clears throat> the, blood, the blood supply of the heart is achieved, like I mentioned earlier, by the coronary arteries. So we have left and right coronary arteries. We know now where the arteries um, originated from. They originated from the aortic sinuses. Um, so 
left first of all uh, actually i'll discuss the overview this is just an overview first before we jump into the uh, arteries yeah so we can see from these schemes this is the sternocostal or the anterior surface of the heart and this is the posterior or the diaphragmatic surface so you need to understand both uh, you need to look at both surfaces when you're studying this because the uh, arteries and indeed the veins obviously are wrapped around the entirety of the heart uh, veins of the heart um, just a point to mention when you talk about veins, don't talk about branches, talk about tributaries. So we, if we're talking about the coronary sinus, which I'll mention in a sec, we, these are all, these bullet points are all tributaries of the coronary sinus. So these are structures which, uh, uh, which drain blood into the sinus rather than being branches of the sinus. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Just please don't confuse those things. Um, so coronary sinus, what is it? It's this large structure located on the posterior surface of the heart. Um, and it's this large bulging, it's a vein, and you can see what you can see which structures it you know receives blood from. Uh, these other two structures are directly draining blood into the right atrium of the heart. Um, into the right atrium of the heart. Uh, uh, so 40% of the uh, blood uh, or the venous drainage is achieved by these direct branches or anterior and the uh, minimal veins, minimal cardi cardiac veins. Uh, so 60% is achieved by um, the 60% is drained into the right atrium by the coronary sinus. In terms of lymphatic drainage, not too much to say here, except that we have left and right trunks. So we have a left anterior and a posterior trunk and a right anterior trunk. Um, I think just in terms of uh, oral exam, it's nice to mention the retro aortic lymph nodes. Um, there are uh, there are some schemes you can look at for this. So just try and understand where you find these lymph nodes uh, around the aorta. Um, so just learn the associations, I think, is, is enough. <clears throat> in terms of the arteries now, um, in terms of the arteries, we have the, uh, first of all, the right coronary artery. So this uh, scheme isolates the artery itself. You can see it shadow as well behind the surface so we are looking at the anterior surface the sternocostal surface um i've just mentioned here the, the 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 sequence basically so it starts from the right aortic sinus we know it travels uh in the coronary groove so the oracle has been the right atrial appendage has been retracted here and it gives off its main branches so it gives off its main branches as soon as it emerges that's something important to mention so the one of the first branches is, is the branch the san there are several branches. I think they're quite logical to remember. Uh, if you remember the passage, so to, you know it's providing branches to the SAN, to the AVN, to the atria, to the ventricles. It has a conus arterius branch. So we mentioned this. This is the infundibulum, the outflow part uh, of the uh, ventricle itself. And um, I will talk about the blood supply of the ventricles in a bit more detail because there's a nice scheme to learn later on. But um, these are the main um, these are the main branches. Um, if I was to isolate some branches, which you absolutely have to know, uh, it would be the um, the right marginal branch, which is found on the right acute surface of the heart, um, and on the posterior side. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got a better image, but on the posterior side, uh, maybe if we go back, yeah. On the posterior side, we have. Um, so again, this is the right uh, coronary artery traveling around over here. Uh, it gives off a branch which is found in the uh, posterior interventricular sulcus. So this is called the posterior interventricular artery or posterior ventricular branch of the right coronary artery. Um, and you can see it quite clearly here. So in terms of the uh, in terms of the left. Uh, coronary artery. <clears throat> it's. Uh, I think it's a bit simpler in the sense that as soon as it emerges, it divides up into its terminal branches. So the terminal, uh, two main branches. Sorry, uh, the first branch it gives off is travels immediately caudally and it's located inside the uh, anterior interventricular sulcus, um, and is called the anterior uh, interventricular branch of the uh, left coronary artery. So. Uh, RIA, so RIA in Latin, um, or LAD, it's also known as the left anterior descending uh, artery. Um, this is really important clinically because it's a very common site for uh, it's a very common site for um, stenting. So cardiologists use this 
uh, access this as well a lot um, in angiography, uh, angioplasty, sorry. Uh, and the second branch is the circumflex branch. This circumflex branch will travel around the inside the coronary sulcus, which we mentioned before, and it will travel to the posterior side of the heart. Uh, it will give off some branches along its course. Okay, so you can see each of these branch, each of these main branches gives off give off branches. Um, it's, it can be variable. I want to mention it can be variable in terms of where these branches and secondary branches are located. So in this scheme, diagonal branches come off the uh, interventri anterior interventricular branch. They could come off the marginal branch. They could come directly from the circumflex branch. So it's just important to know that these exist, first of all, rather than knowing exactly where they come from. Um, the circumflex branch will give off a left uh, marginal branch, left marginal branch. Um, and it will give off some, again, it could give off some diagonal branches, uh, travels to the posterior side of the heart um, where it terminates. So in terms of the distribution, because this is quite clinically significant, clinically important, if there is ischemia uh, of a, one of the papillary muscles, for example, uh, you need to know where, where you know, you can identify where the uh, occlusion is, for example, where the problem is, which coronary artery is, uh, is being problematic. So. This is a scheme which uh, is looking uh, into the into the heart from the top, from the superior side. So you can see the left. This is modeling the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. Uh, and you can see the distribution. These are papillary muscles. So left ventricle obviously contains an anterior and a posterior papillary muscle. And the right ventricle has three because we have the tricuspid valve uh, in the right ventricle. Um, I guess, I guess it's something to just memorize rather than something which is just able to, you're able to understand. Um, in terms of uh, the innovation of the heart, uh, innovation of the heart we mentioned, um, we mentioned that we have, uh, the heart is able to uh, self-excite. So automaticity of the heart is generated from the sinoatrial node. Um, but you'll learn in physiology in more detail that uh, this uh, sinus rhythm can be modulated, and it can be modulated by uh, two two parts of the autonomic system, autonomic nervous system. So it'd be nice to uh, try and understand this now, and co you'll come back to it. You'll come back to this uh, this scheme, for example, this um, you know this this information when you study the ANS in more detail in a few weeks' time. So the autonomic nervous system, just to give you an overview, is divided up into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, I found this really nice scheme, and I've I've sourced this in the uh, in the PowerPoint at the end. Um, but you can see quite clearly here that the red fibers are the sympathetic fibers. So sympathetic fibers come from the lateral horns of the uh, of the spinal column in the region where we find the thoracic sympathetic nerves emerging. So they literally travel they travel through the uh, the sympathetic chain ganglia uh, and enter directly into the heart as the uh, cardiac nerves pay attention to the fact that they're called cardiac uh, nerves. Um, <clears throat> um, something else which um, which I will add, again, I've just realized I've forgotten to add, is that we also have sympathetic nerves coming from the, uh, from the cervical ganglia. So we have a superior, middle, and an inferior cervical ganglion, and each of these three also provide a uh, a cardiac nerve. So these are, this is the sympathetic innovation. What does a sympathetic system do? Um, it's activating or increasing, sorry, the heart rate uh, via the so-called accelerating nerves, uh, increasing blood flow through the coronary arteries, uh, and the opposite takes place. The opposite uh, is achieved with the parasympathetic innovation. Whilst the sympathetic nerves have their origin uh, in the spinal cord, in the spinal column in this section, uh, through the sympathetic chain ganglia, um, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system uh, originates from the vagus nerve. The parasympathetic nerve, sorry, innervation of the heart, uh, originates from the vagus nerve. So again, you'll learn cranial nerves. This is the 10th cranial nerve. And um, the nuclei of the vagus nerve uh, are present uh, in the brainstem here. So you can see um, in uh, sort of this greenish color. I'm not sure how easy it is to see, but in the greenish color, you can see um, where the vagus nerve originates from, and you can see where it exerts its effect. And the action is the exact opposite, so it's decreasing the heart rate and constricting the coronary arteries. What happens is um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, 
will form a plexus. Okay, they'll form plexus, which is uh, a plexus which is located between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. This is the superficial cardiac plexus. This is a mixture of autonomic. This is a mixture of sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers, and a deeper uh, autonomic plexus, which is located behind or posterior to the aortic arch. Um, and they both will innervate the sinoatrial node and AVN, and um, uh, exert their effect. <clears throat> So um, the next few slides, I've got a couple of questions. So uh, sort of these are mock robot questions. They're not um, they're not um, actual robot questions. I've just uh, I've made them myself in, in a similar way to how you'll receive uh, robot questions. So uh, I'll I'll leave the slide up for about twenty to thirty seconds and feel free if you're logged in, feel free to uh, to to comment on the letter the letter you think is correct. So. Have a read. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that uh, for you guys here in first year is that um, uh, please pay attention to the wording of the of the question. Uh, sometimes they throw in negatives, like for example, select the incorrect statement, um, select the yeah incorrect statement, and the last option may still be no statement is correct. In which case, it's all it's implying that all statements are correct. So just please pay attention to the wording. So feel free to uh, comment uh, if you know the answer. And no one's commenting. Okay, so I'll just reveal the answer then. Um, if you've had a read, hopefully you've got it correct. We have mentioned this touchstone briefly. I hope you've revised it as well. So uh, the correct answer is B. So every other statement is, yeah, each other statement is incorrect. Uh, I hope you understand why. Um, feel free to ask if you don't understand why though. So I've got four questions, okay? So second question. So hopefully you understand this one. Um, I think this is a slightly easier question. Um, so hopefully you got the answer correct. None of them are correct. None of these statements are correct. Number three. And the correct answer, if you've got it, uh, all are correct. And the final question, yep, the final question. <clears throat> 
So the correct answer here, oh sorry, incorrect answer here. So just pay attention to the wording, yeah, it's incorrect. Select the incorrect uh, statement. Okay, so uh, let's start talking about the aorta. So we're finished with the heart now. Um, <laughs> so finish with the heart now. Uh, so jumping straight into the aorta, uh, I'll give you an overview and then we're gonna talk about the different parts. So you should know it's the largest, longest artery in the human body. Uh, where does it emerge from? It emerges from the left uh, ventricle, which we've discussed. So basically now we're talking about everything which happens after the aortic uh, valve. Um, it's divided up into three main segments. So we have the ascending aorta, which is a very, very short segment. We have the aortic arch, which gives off, uh, again, which gives off these main branches you can actually see in the, in the uh, scheme here. And then we have the descending aorta. The descending aorta is itself divided up into two regions, two parts, again, based on the region, like I said. Uh, so the thoracic part, which you can see quite visibly here, and the abdominal part, which is not visible here. So it's divided up based on uh, where it's located, if it's located. So basically before the diaphragm, it's the in the thorax, it's the uh, thoracic aorta. And after the diaphragm, when it's in the uh, abdominal uh, cavity, it's the abdominal aorta. Uh, so now we know the we know the start, we know the course, we know the parts. Uh, where does it where does it end? It ends with the bifurcation. So the aorta you should know bifurcates into uh, two common iliac arteries, and the bifurcation takes place at the level of L4. Very important to remember uh, the level of bif the bifurcation. <clears throat> so uh, just a couple of schemes, just so we know we've completed the overview. The scheme is just uh, basically just telling you everything I've said, the one on the left. The scheme on the right, there aren't many schemes uh, in the white book where I would say you don't really need to pay attention because you do need to know, I would say, 90%, 99% 90 of those schemes. But this, this one on the right, these variations, it's not the end of the world if you can't draw them. It's just it's just there for you to understand that there, you know, these variations do exist. Um, but... Uh, the first illustration is the most common, uh, the most common case as it's listed here. So we have the first branch as the brachiocephalic trunk, um, and then we have the uh, number two. Is, sorry, two dash is the uh, left common carotid, and one dash is the uh, left subclavian artery. So let's start off with the ascending aorta first. So it's quite straightforward. It's very, very short, very small segment of the aorta, uh, only two branches, which we've already discussed. So think about the origin. Origin is the third right sternocostal uh, junction located behind the pulmonary trunk. We touched on this before. It's located behind the uh, pulmonary trunk. The initial widening is called the bulbus. You might see this in the book. And this is where we find the aortic sinuses, where the aortic valve is located. Um, so this is the, these, are the, these are the aortic sinuses, and this is the... This is the uh, ascending aorta before it transitions and it travels backwards into the left uh, as the arch of the aorta. Only two branches, left and right coronary arteries, which we've discussed. Uh, so quite nice. Um, <clears throat> so aortic arch. Okay, so aortic arch uh, starts roughly at the level of the second sternocostal junction. Uh, and I mentioned before it turns obliquely to the left uh, side of T3. So T3 um is somewhere here somewhere here yeah so one two three t three uh and it's located anterior as you can see in this image it's located anterior to the tracheal bifurcation tracheal bifurcation is here um at around t4 uh and it travels to the left side of the esophagus again you can see quite nicely where the esophagus is located so you can try and understand the uh the arrangement of these structures in relation to each other um, and you can see the three main branches uh, so when you discuss the arch of the aorta the branches all of the branches of the aortic arch supply uh, oxygen rich blood to the uh, head neck and upper extremities um, so the first branch which we mentioned I mentioned previously is the brachiocephalic trunk so up until here this is the brachiocephalic trunk which divides up into uh, the right 
uh, right uh, subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery. Uh, then the next branch is the left uh, common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. Yeah. Um, in terms of the brachiocephalic trunk, um, <clears throat> you need to know its division, you need to know the subclavian artery, and the continuation is uh, arterial supply of the upper limb, which I'm, I'm not, like I mentioned at the, the beginning of this lecture, I'm not going to go into detail uh, because this was covered last semester. Um, what you do need to know in detail, which I am going to mention today, is the common carotid artery. Okay, so the common carotid artery uh, is, again, I'll just illustrate this scene here. This is the right and this is the left. Common carotid artery uh, in its entirety uh, is supplying the head and part of the brain. I say part because there is, a, there is an arterial supply coming from the vertebral artery, um, which is also supplying the, the brain. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to focus on the common carotid artery and the external carotid artery. I'm not going to talk about the internal carotid artery. I'll show you where it is, but I'm not going to talk about it because the internal carotid artery um, is supply, uh, supplies the uh, brain. So this is covered uh, in neuroanatomy. So you do need to know it, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, so if you look at the illustration, you can see quite clearly how the left common carotid is around four centimeters, or we can say two inches uh, longer than the right. Um, its origin is from the arch of the aorta itself, whereas the right common carotid is coming from the brachiocephalic trunk. Um, the, uh, it both, you can see they both ascend laterally to the trachea and esophagus, and the div division of the bifurcation occurs, and I'll show you a better scheme uh, in the next slide, but the bifurcation of the common carotid occurs at the level of C4. Um, I just want to take a quick pause and just mention uh, that you know these bifurcations are really important. We mentioned the bifurcation of the aorta, which takes which which occurs at, at the level of L4, so the fourth lumbar vertebra. Bifurcation of the um, uh, common carotids take uh, are located at the level of C4. So just remember it's the fourth, yeah, just the fourth vertebra. So cervical vertebra, lumbar vertebra. Uh, <clears throat> So the external carotid artery, um, I'm going to talk about in more detail in the next slide, but it travels from the uh, essentially C4 where the bifurcation is, and it travels all the way to the temporomandibular joint, um, and it gives off a lot of branches in its course, uh, and you can see how the branches are divided up. Um, this is the best way to divide the branches. I think the white book uh, uses this system, so stick to this system. In terms of the actual branches, um, there are a whole bunch of mnemonics out there for learning them. I do remember when I um, when I first tried to uh, like learn the external carotid artery, I found it really difficult to remember the branches, so I used uh, a mnemonic. So I have written a, mnemo a good mnemonic to use here. Um, so the more times you read the names, so superior thyroid, lingual, facial, etc., and you know you remember the mnemonic, you'll start making the associations. Um, and uh, after a while, you know, you won't, you won't even, you won't need the mnemonic at all. Uh, that's the hope. So, main divisions: the, the external carotid artery, like I said in the white book, is divided up into uh, how, or, or rather, the course of the artery itself. So, ventral branches. There are three. So, the first, the very first branch is the superior thyroid, which we can see uh, here, superior thyroid artery. The next one is the lingual artery, which is over here, and then finally we have the facial artery. So, these are the three. Uh, ventral branches, lateral branch is only one, which is to the muscle which is overlying the um, the external carotid artery, uh, and that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which in this uh, scheme has been cut, so it would lie, overlie the entire uh, carotid sheath. Um, dorsal branches, logically the posterior auricular, so r running behind the ear and running to the occipital bone, the occipital uh, artery. And medial arteries. So the medial branches are the ascending pharyngeal artery and the maxillary artery. Um, so, um, yeah, one other point I wanted to mention because it's it's related to the dissections and also um, it's it's one of those points which um, uh, which you can mention in the oral exam. Uh, and um, you know, you, it's not something which you'd be penalised for not saying, but it's uh, one of those additional points which. Uh, they'd really like to hear if you if you remember, and that's how you uh, can locate the um, lingual artery. So 
from a surgical point of view, um, it's important to know how you can isolate the, uh, the, the and dissect the lingual artery. So there are um, there are two anatomical landmarks which we can use. So we have the so-called like Becklard's triangle and Pirogov's angle. They're both they're both similar places. So uh, hopefully you can see this image clearly. But we're focusing on this area here. So this is the external carotid artery, and this is the um, uh, this is the uh, lingual artery here. <clears throat> So Becklard's angle is essentially the posterior border um, of the hyoglossus muscle, the posterior border of the, um, uh, sorry, the posterior belly of the digastric muscle and the greater horn of the hyoid bone. So just look at an atlas and you can see where this uh, triangle is created um, in this area here. And uh, Pirogov's angle is another angle which is a little diffi more difficult to find in, in literature, uh, but it's essentially the tendon or the inter intermediate tendon of the uh, digastric muscle. Just a quick note, the digastric muscle has an anterior and a posterior belly. Uh, my mouse is not on the posterior belly, it's actually underneath this, this is another muscle. Um, but this is the in tendon, so back to the Pirogov's uh, angle, it's the intermediate tendon of the um, digastric muscle. Uh, the posterior border of the mylar hyoid muscle, which is visible here. This is the mylar hyoid muscle. Um, and the uh, 12th cranial nerve, so the uh, hypoglossal nerve. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Right. Um, when you describe those branches we've just mentioned, uh, you need to be able to explain some of the principal branches, some of the primary branches. Uh, you don't need to focus too heavily on all of the primary and secondary branches, uh, just the main ones which you can actually see in the specimens um, and have a theoretical knowledge of uh, where these arteries run in relation to the muscles and other structures. So this is in terms of detail for each of these um, arteries which we've mentioned previously. Um, you just need to talk about you know, where they're localized. That's it. Uh, and obviously, yeah, where they're localized and, and, and uh, the branches, the main branches. So <clears throat> that is true for all of the branches of the ECA, except for the maxillary artery, because maxillary artery, you need to know in, um, in a lot more detail, um, as you'll see if you've read the white book. So maxillary artery um, <clears throat> is divided up into three parts. So the first part is the mandibular part. So this is a quite a nice illustration. It's, you can see the mandible has been removed. Uh, the head of the mandible has been removed, so we can see the uh, maxillary artery in its length here. So the first portion, or I can use this scheme, the first portion is the mandibular part, second part is the pterygoid part, and the third part is the pterygopalatine part. Okay, so you should be able to recognize this, uh, this uh, structure here, which is the, the pterygopalatine fossa. Uh, might be nice to review this fossa, before you uh, go any further, because uh, you've you've studied it, you've learnt it in terms of the walls uh, for the um, uh, when when you studied the bones last semester. So maybe worth recapping that because we're going to add on the arteries. You're going to need to learn the veins, and then you're going to need to learn the nerves, cranial nerves. So it's a very important clinical structure, um, especially for anatomy. Anyway, so uh, in terms of mnemonics, I think then maybe there are mnemonics to learn here. The way I learned it is I just isolated each part. So mandibular part first. Uh, try and orientate yourself on the Netter's atlas or whichever atlas you're using uh, and just try and I I basically isolate them. Uh, it's a bit difficult for me to lecture um, <clears throat> arteries and veins because um, uh, essentially I end up, I'll end up re just reading names. And uh, the, the best way, the easiest way is, is self-study, I think, for these vessels. So I'm not going to read through them all. Um, I will make, I will basically point out a few mistakes or things to watch out for. So, for example, uh, if you look at the some of the branches, you'll notice there are tympanic arteries. So um, try your best to remember where the tympanic arteries come from. So we can see there's an anterior here, a superior here, which actually comes from the middle meningeal artery. Um, so try and understand uh, the book talks about all of the tympanic arteries in terms of you know primary or secondary branches so just pay attention to that uh, inferior alveolar inferior alveolar is supplying the uh, you can see here and dotted uh, 
So inferior alveolar is supplying the mandibular arcade of teeth, so the teeth and the periodontal uh, areas, and you can see it emerges through the uh, mental foramen here, um, inferior alveolar branch, um, the mental branch or the mental artery. <clears throat> um, Uh, middle meningeal artery in itself is uh, significant when you learn about the um, cranial nerves, um, but um, hopefully, hopefully you'll you'll be able to remember the the, the middle meningeal artery when you learn uh, the uh, auricular temporal nerve. So I won't go into too much detail now. Um, you can see these branches here, the pterygoid part. These uh, the names should should. Uh, should sort of ring a bell for you guys. Uh, these names are related to muscles, the muscles of uh, mastication, the chewing muscles. Um, the pterygopalatine part uh, gets a little tricky because rather than just having one artery to supply the uh, maxillary teeth, we have several arteries. So um, <clears throat> we can see the uh, posterior superior alveolar artery. So the way, the best way to just, the best way to understand this is that we have, just remember that we have uh, superior alveolar arteries, yeah, different to the inferior alveolar arteries, and then the next thing, just the next piece of information to remember is that we have posterior and anterior. Okay, so the posterior will obviously supply the the molars, let's say, and the anterior will supply the canines uh, and incisors and maybe premolars. Um, different texts will divide them up differently. This atlas shows a middle uh, superior, but it's it's quite variable. I think in terms of where you're reading the information from. Um, yeah, okay. So we won't go into too much detail now. Uh, when you, uh, after you studied the cranial nerves, it will be, it might be a nice idea to go back and learn the arteries because um, obviously this scheme hasn't got the cranial nerves on and it makes things a lot more uh, difficult when you have, when you layer on the, uh, the, the cranial nerves but you'll find that the nerves and the arteries and veins have a very similar course a lot of the time. So um, you can try and learn associations in terms of which artery or which branch accompanies which nerve. So just a note for you guys in the future, just to try and recap uh, if you can. Okay, um, so that was the overview. I know it's a very fast overview, but that was an overview of the uh, external carotid artery. Um, I've skipped the uh, blood supply to the upper extremity, and I've skipped the thorax. I want to jump into the the key the key points here, which uh, which I think you should try and understand. Uh, so the abdominal aorta. So now you can see from this scheme, this is everything located after the diaphragm, so below the diaphragm. This is a part of the descending aorta, and you can see where the bifurcation takes place at the level of L4. Um, it's worth mentioning that the uh, aorta, in addition to the inferior vena cava, is a uh, retroperitoneal organ. So hopefully you've re hopefully you've revised the um, the GIT chapters, especially GIT part three. So you'll know what retroperitoneal organs are and what peritoneal cavity is. But I just wanted to ask because uh, just to try and just to try and make this uh, interactive, uh, if you guys can list any uh, retroperitoneal organs, uh, feel free to to type. To type any, so we'll start with primary ones. So primary retroperitoneal organs are um, organs which are embryologically they developed in the um, uh, behind the posterior abdominal wall, and secondary retroperitoneal organs, as you, as you know, are organs which developed in the peritoneal cavity, but then throughout the course of embryological development they migrated behind the posterior abdominal wall. So the aorta and the inferior vena cava are primary retroperitoneal structures. Um, we have obviously kidneys and adrenal glands. Yeah, kidneys and adrenal glands are primary retroperitoneal. Uh, if you know any other secondary retroperitoneal organs, feel free to type. Just a quick recap. I haven't got a question on this, but I just wanted to ask if anyone knows. <clears throat> so intestines, um, got to be a bit more specific, uh, unfortunately. Small intestines are, so the jejunum, ileum, are intraperitoneal, but the duodenum is, ret is secondary retroperitoneal, 
So the entire duodenum, except for uh, except for the superior part. The superior part of the duodenum is intraperitoneal. Uh, <clears throat> liver and spleen, uh, no. Liver and spleen are not located in the peritoneal cavity. They are located uh, <clears throat> in a in a in an area which is lo which is called the uh, supra mesocolic uh, compartment. So liver and spleen are incorrect. Um, if you look at uh, if you look at a, if you look at any 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 scheme of the abdomen, you'll see that there is the transverse mesocolon. Everything above that space is known as the supra mesocolic compartment. Um, so liver and spleen are incorrect. Uh, pancreas, yeah, pancreas is uh, secondary retroperitoneal. Uh, ascending colon, descending colon, and cecum as well are secondary retroperitoneal. Okay. So, uh, in terms of branches, oh, sorry, one other thing to mention. Um, I maybe in a, maybe in a, in another slide I'll have the scheme, but um, it's important to remember the uh, arrangement of the orientation of the aorta and the inferior vena cava. So the aorta is located on the left hand side of the uh, inferior vena cava. So you can see here IVC is over here. Uh, in terms of the branches, we divide up the abdominal aorta into uh, paired, uh, sorry, uh, parietal branches, which are um, very, very small. Sometimes you can't see them, but you can see them on this scheme here. So these are inferior phrenic arteries. Yeah, these are inferior phrenic arteries here. So these are, as the name suggests, on the underside of the diaphragm. And then we ha also have uh, these small arteries coming off here. These are lumbar arteries. Okay, so these are parietal arteries, uh, branches of the, sorry, parietal branches of the abdominal aorta. Um, in terms of the visceral branches, so visceral branches referring to the organs, we either have unpaired or we have paired uh, branches. So the first three I've listed here are paired branches, and the last three are unpaired branches. Okay, so the middle suprarenal, middle suprarenal come off um, here. It's difficult to see here. Um, yeah, yeah. Then we have the renal arteries either side, and then we have these two structures here. So this is another. This is our final paired structure, which is in males the testicular artery, in females the ovarian artery. Then we have the unpaired structures. So there's a big unpaired structure here. The first one. So after the diaphragm, we have the celiac trunk. Uh, I'm going to talk about these in more detail in a second, but we have the celiac trunk first, then we have the superior mesenteric artery, and then finally the inferior mesenteric artery. So superior, uh, sorry, celiac trunk is supplying, the, the best way to remember this is that it supplies all of the organs in the supramesocolic compartment. So what does that mean? That means, <clears throat> so we mentioned before, uh, liver and spleen were not peritoneal organs. So these are, so the celiac trunk supplies the liver, spleen, um, stomach, um, we'll, we'll talk about all this stuff in a second. Uh, but superior mesenteric artery in general supplies the small intestines, the jejunal ileum, and the uh, inferior mesenteric artery is supplying blood to the large intestines. Okay. Um, terminal branches, we mentioned the division, the bifurcation occurs at L4, and the bifurcation into the common iliac arteries. So this is the common iliac, uh, uh, the right common iliac, left common iliac and also the terminal uh, branch in the midline, which is the medial sacral or median sacral artery. Um, <clears throat> so celiac trunk. Um, so we've already discussed where it's located on the anterior side or the ventral side of the aorta. At the level roughly T12 L1, so this is its arrangement in terms of the other organs. The liver, um, in this scheme, the liver and the gallbladder have been retracted, so they would usually be laying, you know, overlying this this area here, um, and also the stomach, as you've probably noticed, has been removed. Um, this scheme is the same thing, but in the book, you need to know this scheme 100%. Um, so um, when you're studying alongside an atlas, look at the scheme, try and match everything up. Um, I touched on this in the uh, for the previous slide, but you can see. Based on the uh, names of all these uh, uh, branches, you can see which organs they are supplying. <clears throat> Same as how I mentioned for the uh, uh, carotid arteries, when you talk about one of these branches, you need to mention where it's found 
So when you mention the splenic artery, for example, you have to explain how it's on the it's a it's got a tortuous root or whatever coiled structure, and it's located on the cranial, the superior border of the pancreas, uh, which you can see quite clearly here. Okay, that's just an example. Um, the cystic artery. The book mentions it comes from the right hepatic artery. So this is the right hepatic artery, and this is the cystic artery. Um, that's what the book says. It can be quite variable. Um, and please pay attention to the gastro-omental, uh, pancreatic duodenal, all these names, yeah? So these names can be quite confusing if when you first read them. Um, but just try and understand that the left gastro-omental comes from the uh, splenic artery, and the right gastro-omental comes from the uh, um, gastroduodenal artery. So number nine is the gastroduodenal, and number 14 is the uh, right gastroamental. <clears throat> okay, um, I've just included this uh, because uh, epiploic is another name interchangeable with amental. Um, So continuing on with the unpaired branches of the abdominal aorta. So the next one I mentioned was the superior mesenteric artery. So this is located anterior, again, anterior to the aorta, roughly the level of L1, L2. Um, it has a very short course before it enters into the mesentery. So hopefully you remember again from GIT that the, um, the coils of the small intestine are anchored to the posterior abdominal wall by this uh, folding, this duplicature. Uh, peritoneal duplicate, which is which we call the mesentery, uh, and the arcades, so the branches of the um, the superior mesenteric artery, are located inside the mesentery. Uh, it's important to know that we have around 10 to 18 uh, arteries, so that are supplying the jejunum and the ileum, and you also do need to know that the jejunum has around one to two arcades, whereas the ileum, which is located more is located distally has three to four arcades, okay? So more arcades for the ileum. Um, yeah, I just remembered, try and go back to the uh, relevant section in the GIT, I think it's GIT chapter two. Uh, there's a nice table which compares the um, jejunum and ileum. It talks about the diameters, it talks about the foldings, and it talks about the, uh, uh, the arcades as well. So just learn these differences. Um, inferior mesenteric artery. It's located a lot distally, so around L2, L3 level. Uh, again, anterior side of the aorta. And um, yeah, so these are the um, main branches. I've highlighted, uh, I've highlighted these uh, two, um, these two arteries because there is a there is an anastomosis which they've. I don't know how common it is. I don't know how uh, yeah how likely. Uh, you are to have this uh, connection, but there's a connection between the superior and the inferior mesenteric arteries. Um, so this is called uh, Haller's anastomosis. Um, so between the middle colic artery of the superior mesenteric artery and the left colic artery, which comes from the inferior mesenteric artery. So this is the connection. <clears throat> okay, so um, common, so yeah, so bifurcation, of the abdominal aorta gives rise to the common iliac arteries. Um, the common iliac artery will divide into um, will divide up into the internal and external uh, iliac arteries. Uh, external iliac arteries will continue uh, to supply the uh, lower extremity, which, uh, as you probably guessed, I'm not going to discuss today. But I will discuss the internal iliac artery because it's the um, uh, it's the blood supply, provides the blood to the um, pelvic organs, pelvic viscera. Um, hopefully you studied some of these branches in terms of the parietal branches. Uh, last semester, you needed to know some of these parietal branches. So hopefully you remember the, uh, so for example, hopefully you remember the iliolumbar arteries, lateral sacral, obturator, superior inferior gluteal arteries. Um, these, uh, so, that, so the lateral sacral, iliolumbar, and um, the gluteal arteries all arise from the posterior division of the internal iliac artery. And uh, so hopefully, yeah, we can see them quite nicely here. So yeah, these are posterior, these posterior branches are um, the ones I just mentioned. 
and all of the uh, branches which innovate, uh, sorry, innovate, so which supply the anterior, uh, sorry, the pelvic viscera are anterior branches. So if you know the organs, I think it's quite logical. Uh, the arteries have the same names. Uh, when it comes to um, rectal uh, arterial supply, there are multiple arteries which supply the rectum. So it might be worth going back, checking the GIT chapter, looking at the last section on uh, on blood supply and innovation of the, the rectum. Um, and um, hopefully that will make things a bit, a bit clearer to understand where the actual arteries come from. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, <clears throat> because um, uh, it's clinically significant, is there is a structure or there is a region which is called the corona mortis. So in Latin, corona mortis, it translates to um, kind of death, crown of death. Um, and it's a, I think I have a, yeah, corona mortis. I've put it next to the obturator artery here because it's a connection between the internal iliac artery and the external iliac artery. So the internal iliac artery, it's branch, namely the obturator artery and the, a branch of the external iliac artery, usually the inferior epigastric artery. So this is just a communication between the two uh, iliac arteries, um, and it's given the name, this coronal mortis, coronal death. It's, um, it's got some surgical relevance, which I won't go into, but uh, this is something which has been mentioned in lectures before. Um, yeah, one other thing I forgot to mention, there's a couple of points here, some, some, some overview points. One of the important things is that the division uh, of the common iliac arteries uh, so uh, yeah the division of the common iliac arteries arises anterior to the sacroiliac joint uh, okay that was the pelvis done so now I'm going to just run through the veins uh, if you studied the arteries in a decent level of detail the veins I think are quite straightforward uh, definitely the veins of the head and neck are a lot easier than the you know the carotid arteries and stuff so if you know the course and the location of the uh, external carotid artery branches, uh, you know, these veins are, I think, are very straightforward. Uh, another thing to mention before we talk about this is that, uh, you know, if you're looking at multiple sources, multiple images, you might find a lot of variation. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that because um, you can mention this in your exam as well. Uh, the veins uh, are, can be quite variable. So especially the veins of the head. Um, we can distinguish main main structures. Okay, so the main structures we can see here are first of all the facial vein, and just remember as well um, when we talk about veins, we start from the uh, we start from the opposite end. So we start from the area which is being drained. So <clears throat> technically, I should say the vein starts from the supraorbital and supratrochlear veins. They will then drain into the facial vein. The facial vein will then drain into the uh, the retromandibular vein. So that's how I would I would talk about it in a series in a logical uh, series of events. But just to illustrate, this is the facial vein. Facial vein is here. In this section, it's actually called the angular vein. In the same way that we have the facial artery, which is located also here, you can see it's been cut, but the facial artery is here, has the exact same course, and again, it's called the angular artery here, uh, adjacent to the nose. The facial vein, like I mentioned, receives these two supra uh, orbital and supratrochlear veins. The lingual vein receives the dorsal lingual vein, which is not easy to see here, uh, but its other branch, which is located here. This is called the vena comitans. So in Latin, it's vena comitans nervi hippoglossi. So it's the uh, comitans, just meaning, I guess, running with uh, the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, which itself is very visible here. And um, pay attention, structures in the head and neck. When it comes to arteries, veins, and nerves, uh, it's very common questions here because there are a lot of structures, a lot of things going on. So this yellowish structure is the hypoglossal nerve, and you can see this uh, blue structure here, which is the, the vena comitans, which I just mentioned. Uh, maxillary nerve, uh, sorry, maxillary vein uh, is located here. It receives blood from this, this mess here, this... This whole network is known as the pterygoid plexus. So the pterygoid plexus receives its blood from the areas uh, where it's located and it drains into the maxillary um, vein. Um, maxillary vein itself, and this is quite variable, it can drain into the facial vein, it can drain into the, this structure here, which is the retromandibular vein, 
Uh, and also there's an occipital vein as well. So occipital drainage, uh, you can see the occipital vein here. Um, and the book will talk about some other structures as well, posterior um, auricular, transverse facial. Um, these are structures which you should be able to see in dissection specimens. I hope you guys still have the dissections, um, but um, they're still important structures. So you'll see these in the book. Um, so pay attention to these other structures. Um, in terms of the neck, uh, in terms of the neck, we have uh, the jugular veins. So located very, very close, or rather around, I would say, the carotid artery, um, we have the jugular veins. So there are there are a few jugular veins we need to talk about. Um, I like this scheme because you can see on the right-hand side, the um, sternocleidomastoid muscle, so this muscle here, uh, and the coverings are left intact, whereas they have been dissected on the left-hand side. So we can see the external jugular vein here. The external jugular vein is located superficially, as you can see, to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, um, <clears throat> whereas the internal jugular vein is located uh, is located deeper, so a lot deeper, deeper to the muscle. Um, and it's the internal jugular vein which is located next to the common carotid artery, which you can see here. Uh, external jugular vein receives the retromandibular vein. So we, we, we mentioned the retromandibular vein in the previous slide. So this is generally draining uh, all, of the, all of the blood from the facial region. Um, so that blood will drain into the external jugular vein. Um, also receives the posterior auricular no, uh, vein, sorry. Uh, internal jugular vein, um, I'm not going to discuss, but it receives the blood which is being drained from the, uh, from the brain through the uh, dural venous sinuses. So don't worry too much now. Um, you know, you'll recap this stuff when you do the brain uh, in a few weeks. <clears throat> so uh, other structures which drain into the, uh, which are present in the neck are the internal vertebral venous plexus and the thyroid veins. So we have different thyroid veins. The book goes into detail about where we find the thyroid veins in relation to the thyroid gland, which you can see here. Um, I just wanted to mention a quick point as well, venous angle. We're going to talk about this in a second, but the venous, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, actually, this is what we talk about. Uh, the venous angle is a confluence, okay? So uh, if we just talk about the continuation of the uh, jugular veins, the jugular veins, the internal jugular vein, rather, and the brachiocephalic vein, which is receiving blood from the upper extremity, will combine. And the location or the area where they combine is... Uh, uh, is the, I guess, the the part where they join to form the superior vena cava. So venous angle, the confluence of internal jugular vein and subclavian vein on either side uh, of the neck, which then flow, sorry, I made a mistake, which then flow into the brachiocephalic vein. And then the two brachiocephalic veins will unite to form the superior vena cava. I just wanted to mention that because uh, I'm not talking about the upper extremity today or the, um, the, the, the venous uh, system in the thorax. So we'll skip to the pelvis and the abdomen. Um, because we're starting from the tributaries, we'll start with the pelvis. Um, <clears throat> I found two really nice schemes in uh, netters, one for the male, one for the female uh, pelvis. I've used the specimen for the, the, the I've used the male one here. Um, and the description here includes the uh, female uh, structures as well. But you can see very nicely that the veins accompany the arteries. Okay. Um, and through most instances we have plexuses okay so we have a sacral venous plexus rectal venous plexus you can see vaginal plexus prostatic plexus so there are there are networks of veins uh, which are wrapped around the organs uh, of which they have the same name um, the, the plexuses will drain into the common uh, iliac veins via either the internal or external iliac veins uh, just a point to mention external iliac veins um, receive all the blood from the femoral veins, which you should remember from last semester. Uh, and common iliac veins will arise to the level of the sacroiliac joint. So same as the bifurcation or the division of the common iliac arteries. So sacroiliac joint is the landmark to remember. Also receives the medial sacral uh, vein. Um, and some points again on terms of syntope of the, of the veins themselves. The common iliacs, uh, common iliac veins will unite to form uh, the inferior vena cava. Okay, so that's the pelvis. So when we talk about the abdomen, we need to discuss um, things a bit differently because we have another 
uh, a blood drainage system, which is draining the abdominal organs. Um, so we need to talk about the portal system. Um, so the portal system uh, drains blood from the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Specifically, it's the abdominal part of the esophagus. Um, so the, part, the portion of the esophagus, which is located beneath the diaphragm, uh, so that part of the GIT all the way up until the superior part of the rectum, that's all drained by the portal system. In addition to the, uh, the GIT, the segments which I just mentioned, the portal system drains blood from the spleen, the pancreas and the gallbladder. Um, I've mentioned, put a note here just saying just to recap the liver chapter, uh, specifically pay attention to the fact that the liver has a dual circulation. Um, so there's a couple of organ systems you should hopefully know that have a dual circulation. Liver is one. Um, the um, lungs <clears throat> are one as well. A dual circulation. Um, so back to the portal system. This scheme on the left is one which is uh, which is found in the in the white book. So it's a very simplistic scheme, um, but I think it, it, it makes things quite easy to understand. Um, you have uh, gastric veins, cystic veins. <clears throat> portal, uh, sorry, splenic veins, and then we have the two uh, mesenteric veins. All of these veins uh, will, can, will, will will basically trans transport the blood, the venous blood, from the uh, intestines or the organs uh, to the liver. That's the important thing to mention here. Um, you can see what happens here. The, uh, the, the portal vein itself arises behind the duodenum. Uh, and it ascends in, and I hope you remember this from the GIT chapter, it ascends in the uh, hepatoduodenal ligament, uh, which is located in the lesser omentum. I've put a page reference there for you. Please have a look at that figure. And uh, it enters into the porta hepatis, which divides again into the left and right uh, uh, branches and then lobar branches. So this blood from the GIT, so nutrient-rich blood from the GIT, uh, is being transported via the liver. From the liver, it's then transported via the hepatic veins to the inferior vena cava. Um, so it's very really important to remember this because you need to understand that there are two systems at play. There is the portal system and then there's the cable system. So the cable system, is, so the superior and inferior vena cava, um, which uh, drain everything else basically. So if you just pay attention to the the, the, the part of the body which is drained by the portal system. And just remember, everything else is drained by the directly by the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava. Uh, <clears throat> the reason you need to understand this is because there are connections between the two systems. So connections between the portal system and the uh, cable system are called portocaval uh, anastomosis. Um, so there are a few written in the white book. Um, so you need to understand, uh, first of all, you need to understand the systems then you can understand the um, connections. So why do we have these anastomoses? These are connections uh, between areas drained, as I've written in here, by the portal vein and areas drained by the cable system. So if we have portal hypertension, hypertension referring to high blood pressure because of, I don't know, there's a, there's a whole number of pathologies, I've written in here one. So any type of hypertension in the portal system will allow blood to bypass it, this, the portal system, and travel back to the heart uh, via the cable system, okay? But because of hypertension, these cable veins aren't used to the higher uh, pressure, therefore they will generally, uh, you know, enlarge and become prominent as varicosities. So um, I've listed a few examples here. Uh, the highlights in blue are re refer to the sections which are in the portal system, and the, 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 the text in black refers to the, the, the parts or the anastomosis, uh, which is contributed by the... Um, Cable system. Um, esophage number one, uh, you need to know this association because this can lead to esophageal um, varices. Uh, number two, uh, rectal veins. Um, number three is an important one clinically because um, of something called caput medusa, which is um, feel free to um, <clears throat> feel free to Google what this looks like. They are superficially uh, located tortuous veins. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, on the uh, on the the abdomen in the abdominal region, um, we have uh, yeah a lot of a lot of connections, Burrows veins and ret retius veins, which are located around the colon and the rectum. Uh, 
So I mentioned before, uh, to, 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 I mentioned before, please study the, the, the veins of the colon, study the veins uh, and the arteries of the rectum. Um, and the veins are anastomotic here. Uh, there are two other, I guess, less significant connections. Um, but the one which is mentioned, one which is mentioned in the white book, is the uh, area on the bare surface of the of the liver. Hopefully, you remember where this is. This is an area without any uh, covering um, on the superior anterior surface where the diaphragm is present, um, and we have hepatic and, and phrenic veins interacting. Uh, and also, this last point, the ductus venosus, is a embryological structure which generally which closes after birth slowly but if it's, it's if it's open or rather if it's recanalized in terms of and that means that it's closed and then it you know opens up afterwards uh it can become patent and uh, form a connection between the hepatic veins the second type of anastomosis which we need to learn is between two regions of the cable system so we know we have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava so there can be connections between the two systems so these are called cable cable anastomosis i'm sorry for the um there's no images, it's a very uh, wordy slide, um, <clears throat> but I've, you know, I'll upload this for you guys, you can have a look at the detail, but I've just outlined the, 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 the passage, so how blood travels from superior to inferior vena cava. Okay, so depending on the obstacle, it can flow in either direction. Um, so I've divided it up into, you know, this, and unfortunately this uh, cable cable anastomosis section is not present uh, in the white book, for whatever reason, but it is an oral exam question, so it can be a bit, you know, confusing where to find the answers. Um, look from, look on, you know, you can use this slide, you can use Memorix, Memorix has this uh, written out quite nicely as well. So I've divided it up into anterior abdominal wall and posterior abdominal wall. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go through them all, I just want to mention uh, the posterior abdominal wall. Uh, these are very significant, you will see these veins very clearly, azygous and hemiazygous veins. Uh, you will see them very clearly um, in the dissections. Um, you need to know uh, exactly where they're located, exactly where they travel, um, which structures they're adjacent to. So pay attention to those, please. And also, um, the yeah, there are two plexuses, internal and external, around the vertebral column. Um, and again, this is a very, very important uh, cable cable anastomosis. Um, okay. So that's just a general overview of the uh, veins. Um, I've got a test now, four question test uh, on the vessels. Some of the questions cover um, some of the questions cover veins, which we, I haven't discussed directly today, but um, they are from you know like the, super, the the upper extremity or the lower extremity. So hopefully it's a revision for you guys. Um, same system applies, just type. Type the answer if you know it, um, and then I'll reveal it in a, in a short while. Okay, so uh, the answer is uh, B. So correct statement. <clears throat> uh, this is something which uh, I've thrown in because, uh, and I've intentionally, I, I didn't mention this uh, in the explanation because um, it's 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 an anatomical um, you know uh, landmark which you need to understand. You need to understand quite well because uh, unfortunately I haven't got an image here. But if you look at the abdominal um, uh, if you uh, abdominal image of the viscera removed, you look at the inferior vena cava, um, you'll see that the, the ovarian and or testicular veins drain differently, whether you're looking on the left or the right side. So uh, the correct statement here, as you can see, is that the, testic the left testicular vein drains directly into the left renal vein, which it, then it, obviously the, the left renal vein drains into the inferior vena cava. It's different to the right-hand side because on the right-hand side, the right testicular vein, <clears throat> vein, or ovarian vein, will drain directly into the inferior vena cava. So, just a little difference there. So, on the left side, the vein drains into the renal vein. On the right hand side, is directly into the inferior vena cava. Um, 
Okay, so next question. I guess this one's uh I guess this one becomes quite easy actually now that I've explained what I just did. Okay, so the answer because I just explained it. Um but please pay attention to you know all of the when you when you have a robot question, uh read all of the statements carefully and like i mentioned before pay attention to the what the question is asking okay so incorrect statement uh, in this case um, so third question uh, on the inferior vena cava And the answer, <clears throat> so the answer is is not is not C because uh, inferior mesenteric vein, as we mentioned, drains into the portal, the portal vein. So that's why the answer is incorrect. Um, I'll just I'll run through this one quickly because you answered uh, left ovarian vein, as we mentioned, drains into the uh, left renal vein, so that's incorrect. Uh, C, inferior mesenteric, drains into the portal vein, and again, D drains into the portal vein as well. So uh, B is correct, the hepatic veins do drain into the inferior vena cava directly. And the last question is on the cephalic vein, so uh, this is a you know, re recap into the, I guess, if you studied this last semester quite well, you'll know this. Okay, so the answer, correct answer is A. Um, so if you uh, if you struggled with uh, you know the questions on the heart, struggled with the questions on the the vessels, obviously there are only four questions. It's not really representative. Um, please go and revise the relevant uh, areas. In terms of uh, what was not covered today, I didn't cover the. Um, uh, the uh, obviously the, the 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 veins and the arteries of the upper extremities, lower extremities, the thorax, um, and lymph as well. I think pay attention to all these all these all these gaps. Go and revise. Go and revise the um, the relevant arteries and veins in these areas. Go and revise lymph. Lymph is a common uh, is a common area which people tend to avoid. But please please uh, don't don't leave them because you need to know rough lymph nodes. You need to know generally where the lymph nodes are for each, each passage, and you need to know about the left and the right lymphatic uh, tract. Okay, uh, so just put some list of sources on here uh, for you guys if you need to, if you need to access this uh, PowerPoint uh, after today. Um, and if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Um, thank you for listening. I hope this, uh, I hope this stream was, was, was clear for you guys. I hope everything was good, display and audio and whatnot. Um, so feel free to give some feedback um you can find the feedback form uh in the uh in the in the discussion part uh of the the facebook event um and yeah thanks guys uh difference of the valves yeah sorry i can go through questions now yeah so difference in the valves so uh difference in the valves is that we have semilunar and we have atrioventricular valves okay two different valves um the atrioventricular valves so the on the left side, the mitral valve, right side, tricuspid valve, they are um, 
they are composed of cusps, chordae tendinae, and papillary muscles, and they open and close depending on the contraction of the papillary muscles. Um, <clears throat> so that's the thing to understand there. That's how they that's how they operate. They operate because of the contraction. Uh, the semilunar valves are not operated or not uh, influenced by any muscles, but they are op they basically work via the uh, passage of blood flow. So when blood flows through the aorta, for example, the sem uh, the aortic uh, valve is open, um, and when blood rushes back in the opposite direction, uh, it fills the aortic sinuses, and the semilunar valve will close as the sinus fills up with blood. Um, and that's how it opens and closes. So there's no, there are no, there are no muscles involved. Muscle mechanics aren't involved for the semilunar valves, whereas the papillary muscles are actively uh, opening the uh, the tricuspid and mitral valves. So thanks for uh, thanks for listening. If you have any more questions, uh, just uh, drop us a message anywhere, social media, or drop me a message. Um, yeah. So thanks again, guys. Hope you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, yeah, thank you.